welcome to Invisible Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. I'm your host, Dean Anderson, and on today's show, I have Ahmed Safa from Canadian Security Solutions. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's up. I'm gonna. I'm gonna reword that. It's always a pleasure. Oh, stop. It's. A- <laughs> you're, making, you're making me blush. Man. <laughs> uh, we have had the pleasure of working together before in the past. Yep. Uh, in the in the front line, working with the homeless population, and I and that's you know the reason why I wanted to have you on the show because there's something very special that you do Ahmed thank you there's something very special um and it's and it's you know and it's heard I um a couple of years ago I I made a post on social media I don't know if you remember I remember that do you yeah. remember that yeah I made a post on social media with a photo of you and it was just this kind of thing as you know here's this guy who works in security and then on his day off he's here helping um and giving out food and socks and stuff to the homeless um and most of the time that type of person would be so tired and go home and be like, screw that kind of feeling. So I put this post on social media and it pretty much went viral. It just went yeah. all over the place. Up, yeah. It blew up really big. Um, and I didn't recognize, you know, what I was actually looking at in that moment until I saw all the comments and all the interactions and all the people. Um, so you do have something very special and I'm going to say that on television. So thank you. Make sure we lock that down. <laughs> thank you. But you've taken that, you've taken that and made it into something else. Um, I would love for you to kind of tell me a bit about Canadian Security Solutions and what it is. You're not just a normal um, security company, correct? Correct. Correct. Even though you got that, you you sure look like a normal (laughs) security company. Yeah. Tell tell me about it. Yeah. So, you know, my dream was to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was the best way I could help people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to do it forever. But, you know, I started working at the shelter about six years ago when I met you. And um, I just, you know, I found the need for education and security because I started there. I didn't get any, I didn't get the appropriate training to work there. I didn't really understand how to work with people who experience homelessness, trauma, addiction. So over time I learned and, you know, when I first started security, I learned the wrong approach. I started bouncing. I learned the go physical approach, knew nothing about de-escalation. So when I came to the shelter and I tried that approach, I said, okay, this doesn't work. So I started putting myself in people's shoes and learning a lot more about them and their story. And I was like, wow, like no one's getting any training in this. Nobody's understanding what, how they actually have to approach people, you know? So over time, I gained my experience and I had other agencies in the social services reach out, other shelters, outreach services, uh, reach out to me and ask me if I wanted to come and join their team. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a security guard. Like, you guys don't have security. They're like, no, but you know how to deal with people. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. So I, you know, I ended up joining their team. I still stay with my role with the uh, Salvation Army where I met you and um, you know, I built some experience in other areas, not just security. Uh, one being, you know, the youth shelter, outreach services for, you know, London Cares, homeless response services, who by the way, do an incredible job, um, you know, and they take a lot of heat from the community, uh, but I'll get into that later. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I found a need, we need education for security guards. So I said, okay, maybe policing, Maybe I can do policing and help people, but I think I can help more people by training security the right way. We see there's a homeless crisis, a mental health crisis. We need more security guards on the street. Police can't handle everything. So we need to step up and do more and take stress off emergency services, you know, backs, you know, take some calls out of that queue and start diverting people to services that would benefit them instead of backing up the call logs instead of backing up the waiting room in the in the hospitals, you know? There's places we can direct people that need it. And I train my guards on where to send people who need, you know, these resources that other people don't think of. You know, for a lot of people, it's just kind of, let's call the police. Let's call it, you know, let's call the EMS, you know, paramedics. I don't want to do that. I want to connect people to services that will benefit them and benefit the emergency services and benefit the city. So 
it helps everybody when we're all on the same team working together you know when everybody knows what they're doing everybody's learning and they have the knowledge to deal with people it's it's going to help you know it's going to it's going to it's not going to solve the problem but it's going to take a big dent out of the problem so right so you you said that you know there was a a, a more hands on approach mm-hmm. so how were you trained what well, like how did that come about like why why is it that that's the the norm in security services to go to a hands on or physical approach um i feel like a lot of services don't want to invest in training and they kind of want to just you know get rid of the problem right away so the fastest way to do that i mean if you look at me i'm a big guy i can grab somebody and toss them out very quickly I got a big heart. I, you know, I always feel bad when I have to go hands on, even when it's justified. But like I said, I, I don't think agencies want to invest the money into proper training. And, you know, police aren't showing up because they have bigger things to deal with. So we got to resort to physical, you know, in, in their eyes. And and that's and I, I think it comes down to money at the end of the day. They're not charging the client enough, they're not making enough money. So they just resort to get rid of the problem and move on. Mm. So, yeah, we see that with the funding for sure, right? So there's, yeah. a, there's a lack of funding. Absolutely. Most of the frontline services are, you know, kind of month to month trying to figure out what they're going to do next, how yeah. they're going to pay for things. Yeah. So the idea of having security is more of a last resort kind of measure versus preventative maintenance. Is, exactly. that, fair? is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. Because you can't rely on police anymore, right? Yeah. So you have to, you know, you got to protect your building, you have to protect your people. You have to invest in security now. You can't really operate without it. I understand it doesn't make you money, but it's it's got to happen. Services cannot run without it. Not not all of them, but many of them cannot run without it. Mm-hmm. So, One of the things that I think was really super confusing, and I know you're not a police officer and I don't yeah. expect you to answer a question on their behalf, mm-hmm. but I know that when we work with social services, there's a lot of misconceptions of what the police's role is. For sure. Um, and I think that that's what you're kind of alluding to. It. There's things where we can say, because um, a lot of people just pick up the phone and call the police for just about anything. Exactly. What are some of the big misconceptions do you think that, you know, people would benefit from security versus calling the police? Well, I mean, when you call a police officer, most of them are, I, I think it was about 89, 90% of them are overworked. A lot of them are not educated with the people we deal with on the daily Mm. when you hire a security guard they're there every day they build rapport with the participants Mm. they get to know everyone that person no longer wants to cause problems for you Mm. when you're kind and respectful to them you're going to get that back 99 percent of the time you know i've had the odd person over the years who was not in the right state of mind and no matter how nice i was they just come at me but 99 percent of the time you're going to get a good outcome because you've worked with that person every day they know you they trust you and they want to work with you, right? Mm-hmm. When you call a police officer, I mean, some of the, some of the times they may know the police officer and they're cool with them, but majority it's like, you know, I don't like police. I have trauma. One, two, three. I don't want to, mm-hmm. you know, I want to give this guy a hard time. Whatever the case mm-hmm. is. So, fortunately, we do have you know services like Coast, where mm-hmm. we'll try and resort to, uh, depending on the you know the state of the mind of the person we're dealing with. But we know that they're trained a lot more in, in the field we work in. Mm-hmm. Now, they don't operate 24-7, I don't think, so it's a little harder to go around the clock. But mm-hmm. when you, like I said, when you hire a security guard, they they know that person. They're there every day. Mm-hmm. They build report. Mm-hmm. So. so for those people that don't know what COAST is, COAST is a, an integrated social services with police. So a police officer and a social worker or somebody in the mental health field will show up and help de-escalate that situation. But what I heard you say, and this was a big thing that we dealt with, was um, a lot of times the police showing up didn't de-escalate. It actually escalated the situation because of some of the trauma or the concerns that were there. So we think that the police are going to be the answer, but usually it it turns into a a more confrontation. Exactly. And it can just be their uniform, right? Yeah. Sometimes I'll be in uniform and I'll take off my uniform and put on my, my personal coat. And that will, you know, it all depends on the situation. But mm-hmm. for the most part, if they see someone in normal clothing, they'll want to talk to them. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you just got to, you know, ask the other guard to step out. You step in in normal gear, you know, as long as you feel safe and mm-hmm. nobody's in danger. But 
yeah, for the most part, it could just be their uniform that, that mm -hmm. triggers them. So. Mm -hmm. I could see how your uniform um, could come off as commanding or even borderline, I mean, the safety part that's there, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you look like you're going to jump into an action movie in a second and <laughs> pull a hand grenade out of your beard and, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. how, do, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? How do you, I mean, you, you're obviously changing of the clothes, yeah. but um, are there ways for you to approach individuals to give them a, a, a greater sense of recognizing that you're doing what you're doing for your safety and it's not about you know, trying to be intimidating or whatever. Cause you're, you you mentioned it already. You're a big dude, right? For sure. Um, for sure. So um, uh, it, I could see how that could, you know, come off as intimidating. What are some for of the sure. things? So the biggest thing for me is when I approach a situation, I like, I smile, you know, I come off as a, a big teddy bear. I want to smile. I want to, I don't want to be intimidating. Mm -hmm. Now I wear this because it's to protect myself and it's to protect you. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's coming at, another participant, I'm going in the way and I'm stopping them. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the hit. If somebody comes at a staff member, I'm stepping in front of them, I'm taking the hit. Mm -hmm. So I I'm basically a human shield, right? And I gotta, I gotta wear this to protect myself. Mm -hmm. But to get around that, like I said, it's, it's approaching the situation differently. You know, don't come in all big and bad like this. You know, come in as a friend mm -hmm. in, a, in a friendly, soft approach, smile, you know, it's all about your your body language and what you say and how you say it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I rule. <laughs> right. Yeah. So for sure. I mean, it means a lot to an individual if you come in. Uh, the same thing with counseling, right? And the right. stuff that we do, um, we're trying to recognize how we're standing, how we're sitting, how we look, how our right. faces. If I'm sitting right here, yeah. like, come on, sit down. Let's get you yeah. some help. <laughs> I'm probably not going to go over so well, right? <laughs> right, right? So it has a bigger impact, but. So that's something that's not trained in normal security situations, or is it no. just, wow. It's not. So th there's there's really not much training in security. I mean, you do, you know, a 32 hour course online, you know, and, and that's it. It's all basic stuff from years ago. Um, you know, I'm trying to change that, but uh, that's a story for another day. I think that there should be things mandatory in a security course nowadays. I think that there should be, you know, more in class, uh, you know, seeing presentations and, and, and being taught in an actual classroom for mm. maybe a week instead of just 32 hours online. Mm. You can do that in two days, you know? So I'm working to get things mandated in that security course mm. that aren't in there right now. Yeah, show of hands if you want to learn how to be a a human shield in only 32 hours. <laughs> no, right? no, 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 thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, nobody wants to do it. And you know, there's, it, it's starting to get a little different in the security field. Um, it's not as effective as it once was. And I think that's because of, you know, what's going on in the city now. It, mm. Things are changing, right? Mm. There's, you know, newer drugs out there that are causing people to be in a different state mm. of mind. They're more escalated. One, two, three, people don't want to, you know, they're not getting paid enough to jump in there and do, mm -hmm. you know, what, what I was doing or what I'm doing right now, right? So that's that's it. It's no, that that's awesome. So we're gonna we're gonna come right back to that sure. because that's the direction I totally want to sure. talk about the the escalation and the change in the For city sure. and the drug use and all that stuff. It's a hard thing. So we'll be back right after this break. Welcome back to Invisible Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. And today we're talking to Ahmad Safa. He is such a great guy, and he's just here, just sharing all this. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump, I'm gonna pump <laughs> you, you up. Blush I'm gonna pump you up all day, buddy. <laughs> um, so right before break, we were talking about the escalation and the changes in uh, mental health, homelessness, and addiction in the street. I have had uh, the unfortunate uh, experience of watching it escalate over the years. Uh, I think since COVID as well, yep. and um, there's a lot more to being in the front line than just people picture it like, uh, you know, just pouring some bowls of soup for people yeah. and making sure some people have some clean socks. It's a, it's a pretty different thing. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen happen over the, over the years that you've been doing this and Absolutely. that changes? And you're right. It's uh it's more than just that, you know, you could, you could be approaching someone and, you know, having the best day and, you know, you give them all your love and attention and they can come at you, uh, you know, with some words that you don't want to hear. And, you know, maybe some, some, fists that you don't want to see thrown at you. But uh, at the end of the day, you recognize that that person has been through something to get them in that state 
So you just got to kind of hold back and, and say, you know, keep your emotions in and just, you know, understand that this person needs a little bit of help and, you know, you're still there to help them out. And, and they, you know, they recognize that. And that's when the rapport is built and, you know, you, you create a good relationship with them. And, you know, that's, I, I wish it was easy and it's not just black and white. It's more of a gray area where, you know, you, you want to go out and just help everyone and, and this and that, but you know, it's, it's tough, mm -hmm. you know, people pop off when you least expect it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to be ready at any, any given moment. So mm -hmm. the, the increase, we've had the big fentanyl scare, mm -hmm. um, overdosing, uh, all of those things happening. How has that been uh, something that you've had to adapt with to or around <laughs> those huge, um, cause there's uh, all of a sudden you're, you're not just a security guard, you're you're a doctor almost yeah. like not, not that you are, but no. you know what I mean, right? Yeah. This, you have to do, deal with physical health problems and, yes. and that sort of stuff. How, how have you had to adapt to that? Well, I think my, you know, the first overdose I dealt with was maybe five or six years ago. And it was such a huge deal back then. And you know, I had to do, you know, uh, CPR and I didn't even know that I, I knew CPR. I just kind of like, okay, I did a, I did a class to learn about it, but I never actually put it to the test. So, when I actually had to go in and use that, you know, use that tool, it was kind of like, whoa, this is real. This, you know, this will actually save a life. And it did. So, you know, I remember it being such a big deal. And now the crisis is so much worse. And, you know, here I am 60, 65 overdoses later. And it's like, it's just another day on the job, you know? So, you know, you learn a lot, you learn, you know, every overdose you deal with, you learn more and more. So it gets easier dealing with it. Um, so it, it's, it's cool that, you know, I get to save lives and, you know, I get to train people to save lives and, um, you know, I never thought I would be in this position, but this is, um, this is a, an issue for the whole country. This is something we're seeing every day. You know, unfortunately, I think we're going to keep seeing more of it. And I think that we need to start educating people on, on this topic, whether it's in schools or in, in, you know, community areas, like in churches or something, just so that people have an understanding of, you know, you know, they're going to be seeing it. They're going to be driving by and they're going to be seeing somebody on the road or on the side of the road and they're going to be passed out. You know, what should you be carrying on you? You know, everybody should carry Narcan on them, in my opinion. Everybody should have first aid and CPR on, um, as that tool, in my opinion. So the, the city is getting worse and we have to work together to, you know, you know, just make sure everyone's alive, you know, and we got to help with this homeless crisis together. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So is this something that Canadian uh, Security Solutions um, is doing? Or are you doing overdose training? And... Yes. Okay. Yep. So we're very different than other security companies. We really focus on, you know, the, the drugs that our participants are using, uh, what the effects and, and the causes that come from it, harm reduction, um, you know, mental health first aid, psychological first aid. There's a lot of things, that, a lot of tools that will help us on the daily job, mm -hmm. right? That other security companies won't invest in. A lot of the other companies will invest in, you know, use of force type stuff. We still do use of force, but you know, we're, you know, we're a company that doesn't have batons or handcuffs, which is huge. I think we're the only company that doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to go into courses that will help people mentally, rather than, you know, carrying a baton and resorting to that. So mm -hmm. the more we invest in training, the, the better, right? Yeah. So, um, what about the other hazards that come along with dealing with people that are in active drug use, like use needles or contact with illicit drugs or, you know, even the the legal complications? Because I know we always had uh, struggles in the past where you would, you know, find drugs or you would find yeah. things that you're, you know, illegal things that you would find in the process of doing your job. Yep. I and mean, what about those precautions and those things? They must play a role. For sure. Um, it's definitely a challenge. And there's not much we can do. I mean, we're not the police and, and even the police when, you know, they got their hands tied, what can they actually do? Like, what can they actually do right now? Everybody's doing it. So we gotta, we gotta compromise. We gotta figure out a plan together. You know, we don't, we don't mind people using, you know, as long as it's in an area where, you know, other people aren't being bothered by it. Like there's, there's certain areas well, where we'll, where we will redirect them so that, nobody's coming at them and you know they're not bothering anyone else right it's a two-way street so we try and uh 
we try and help everybody in the situation. But there are some challenges and, you know, it is, there are some illegal drugs involved. And, you know, when I get a security guard that approaches me and says, hey, am I supposed to compensate this? It's kind of like, no, we don't do that. You know, that person is not well. They need this to live right now. And, you know, until they can get the help or want the help they can get, you know, we just got to do our thing. So mm -hmm. there must be some um, difficult legal concerns that you would have. Because I know that if I was to confiscate drugs from somebody, I'm now in possession of drugs. For sure, for sure. <laughs> so and, yeah. like, okay, great. I <laughs> took it to the police. So, go, why do you, yeah. why do you got that yeah. baggie, uh, Dean? <laughs> I, I down on that one. Yeah. So, yeah. So if, if it does end up in our hands, yeah. we will not give it back mm. because, you know, it's a liability, right? If if I was if I were to return someone their drugs and they were to die or get you mm -hmm. know very sick from it. Mm -hmm. that's now on me mm -hmm. you know i gave it to them mm -hmm. so you know there are situations where and a lot of the shelters now are kind of easing up on that mm -hmm. they're kind of just like okay like this person is not well they need their drugs as long as you don't take you know confiscate those drugs then they're okay you know mm -hmm. what i mean so mm -hmm. it uh it is difficult and it was a bit of a, a process to get that going but um you know what else can you do Right. So it's kind of a hands off because I think, um, you know, the the idea of needing the drugs is is one thing. But the recognition of if I'm just going to take their drugs and they're not ready to lose their drugs, they're yeah. probably going to get violent. They're going to go exactly. off to find more. They're exactly. probably and if they don't have money, then they could increase crime or cause yep. more other problems while they escalate to try and figure out how to get that. So the solution isn't to just take the drugs away. Exactly. Uh, and I think that that's where society's at. We think the that uh, people with addictions are just big children and we need to just take, you know, you're, you're playing with the ball, we're just going to take your right. ball away, right? right? And that will solve the problem, but it's not that simple. Exactly. If I take a bag of chips away from somebody who's very hungry... I'm going to be angry at you. You're going to be angry <laughs> and you're going to go rob the variety store across the street. Yeah. And it's the same thing with drugs, mm -hmm. right? People need it, just like, you know, drugs and alcohol, they need it to live mm -hmm. and there, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's essential. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to that that liability, I'm assuming there must be a lot of um, insurance and a lot of things that you need to do to make sure. Because, um, uh, you know, while you were talking there, I was thinking about the Good Samaritan Act. Yep. Um, and the idea of, you know, not being able to get in trouble for helping somebody with an overdose or being, uh, for those who don't know, it means that if I help somebody with an overdose and the police come and I have drugs on me, they won't charge me right. with the use of the drugs because I stayed to do the help with the overdose. So it's kind of this protection thing to help the exactly. person. I'm assuming there must be similar things when it comes to um, security that say, you know, you can't be sued for giving somebody CPR and you break their ribs <laughs> or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. We're, we're definitely protected. I mean, we're, we're protected under the Good Samaritan Act. Uh, I mean, we do have insurance as a company, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, as long as you're trying to help someone mm -hmm. and you're not causing any serious damage to them, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to be okay. I haven't seen any cases where somebody has been charged or, you know, taken away for, you know, causing damage to somebody when they're trying to do CPR on them, mm -hmm. you know? So I have had cases where, you know, the person that I'm doing CPR on starts throwing punches or they get mad at me or, you know, whatever, the, whatever the case is because I'm ruining their high. Um, but it is going to happen. But as long as you don't get any, you know, legal trouble or anything like that, you're, you're good. You know, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that will get you there anyways. I just, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to help someone out. Sure. Yeah. I was present for one of those instances. I remember when we were there and someone had overdosed and we uh, administered to uh, Narcan and the person was really upset that uh, the Narcan neutralized their high and they got up and... Uh, my friend Abed here had to wrestle the person to the <laughs> yeah. ground uh, because he was being attacked by somebody that we were trying to save their life. It was a, a sure. it was a very difficult, strange moment, um, and uh, but it was met with a lot of compassion and and even though it was physical, it was very gentle. And I always appreciate you for that. Moment. Thank you, thank um, you. It was pretty important. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit more. You had mentioned some of the other organizations in the city, and I know that. I believe London Cares has lost their funding and will be, I heard that in the news. I don't know if that's true and I don't know how long away that is, mm -hmm. but I know that you interact with some of the other city organizations and I want to talk real quick about the role that they play in helping you do your job. For sure. So just going back to London Cares and, you know, their funding that you mentioned, um, the, the whole funding thing was about the hub 
uh, that was supposed to end this month on the 31st. Uh, that did get extended by two months. Uh -huh. um, and I believe community members had a part to play in it. Um, you know, where are these people going to go? You know, hundreds of people access this place a day uh -huh. for shelter, to sleep, to eat, uh -huh. to shower. What happens when you close something like that down? You know, they're going to end up in your driveways. They're going to end up in your lots. Uh -huh. You're going to get even more mad. Uh -huh. So we need to come together as a city, work together to solve this thing. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's uh -huh. going to be years down the, you know, it's going to be years. Uh -huh. So we need things like this. We need, you know, this hub shelter, the stay shelter. This is a bridge to housing, right? Uh -huh. Everybody wants to get everybody housed in one day. Uh -huh. It's not, it can't happen. It's impossible. Uh -huh. We need a bridge to get people there. If you, you know, you want to take somebody out of 10 and you put them in a unit, it's not going to work. That They're not used to that. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's when you have, you know, problems in buildings. You know, you have fires. People are using in their dorms. There's nobody watching them. Uh -huh. They're using alone. So we need these services. And I know a lot of people are against them, uh -huh. but they're the experts. They know what they're doing. I get you want to house everybody in one day, uh -huh. but it's not doable. For these services, you need security. People charge us staff members. Um, people charge up people, you know, it, like there's always going to be issues with the participants and the staff and you got to have somebody there to protect them. You need effective security. Uh -huh. So we train our guards, you know, how to step in, when to step in. We train them on what to say to people. You know, how are you going to calm this person down? How are you going to pull them away from the situation? You know, we're there to protect people. Uh -huh. I, don't, like, I don't expect my guards to step in and, you know, take a stabbing or anything. But there are ways we can pull the problem from someone else uh -huh. and say, hey, I'm here to help you. Look at uh -huh. me. So that's what that's the role that we play, right? We're, we're there to protect people. Uh -huh. We're there to de-escalate situations. Okay. So I want to thank you so much for being on the show again. And I just... There's a couple of things I want to say super quick before we say goodbye, um, and that is um, the idea that um, they're talking about wraparound services and bringing mm -hmm. all of those things back and helping the people and the individuals. Um, also, that uh, you know the services that you provide. You said it doesn't save them money, but I I beg to differ. Um, I think that services like that make it easier for the social workers and the people that are in the places to do their jobs. So it makes them more effective and the more effective people can be, uh, the more you can save money. And it's also looking at uh, property damage and legal problems and all of the things that go along with having effective security can save money. It pays for itself. So right. I'll give you that little, awesome. that, that little pump up I never there. Thought of that. Right. So, yeah. but that brings us to a close. Thank you again for yeah. being on the show. Thank I truly you appreciate you being here. Thank you. Oh, well, awesome. Thank you for watching Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction, and we'll see you next time.